Well, as I prayed just a moment ago, we need help discerning truth from fiction, reality from illusion. When I was in college, the best and hottest movie that was out was a movie called The Matrix. I'm not going to spend much time this because it's been worn out in sermon illustrations, at least for Gen Xers. <laughs> Millennials are like, I've never even heard of this. What is he talking about? Well, you just heard in the last couple of weeks, they're actually going to make a new one. Well, The Matrix was built off of the philosophy of a guy named Boyer. Baudrillard. There we go. It's French. And he wrote a book called Simulation and Simulacra. And in it, what he was talking about is the way that we process the world creates simulated experiences that aren't necessarily real experiences because who can know what's real anyways? And so we are ultimately responsible for creating our own virtual realities, so to speak, our ways of understanding and interpreting reality and of making sense of the world, of answering the ultimate questions. That in a sense, he would say, the matrix has you. And it becomes really difficult then to discern between what is true and what is not true, between what is illusion and what is real. Now, in our day-to-day -day goings and comings, as we perhaps interact on surface level with the world around us, we don't give much thought to this. But when things happen around us, whether on the global scale that we see in our 24-hour news cycles, or whether in our own lives through sin and suffering, through perhaps even being confronted with the reality of, of death, of its sure aim and the fact that it never misses and won't miss for any one of us. Well, then it's there that we begin to consider the bigger questions in life. Why is there evil in the world and what can be done about it? What does it mean to be human? Not just what does it mean, but ultimately, what is our purpose? What is my purpose? Why am I even here to begin with? How am I to make sense of suffering in the world? Is it ever going to end what happens when we die? Do we just biodegrade? Or is there something more? Our world is filled with countless messages, countless gospels that is good news for us to look to, to find hope and security. And yet we as a culture, we as individuals, even often, we find ourselves placing our hope in all of the wrong things. And in that way, we are no different than those to whom the prophet Isaiah was preaching. And so even though we look at Isaiah and we go, whoa, this is thousands of years away, his message is no less relevant to us. What Isaiah is doing, and this is the role of all prophetic ministry, is to speak forth God's word in such a way that we are able now to see reality for what it really is, to cut through the illusion and to know what is true. That is what Isaiah does. That's what we're going to be looking at over the course of this fall and the months that follow. But today, we're only going to be looking at one verse. In fact, we are going to be considering the whole of the book of Isaiah just through that opening description. Chapter 1, verse 1. Let me just read it to you. Hear the word of the Lord. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amoz, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. We're going to be able to take a quick glance at the whole book of Isaiah just to get a little survey, an idea of what's going on and the main themes and what he's aiming to do 
through a handful of things that we can observe in this single verse. And when we do, I want you to hold on to this big idea. All right, if you're taking notes, this would be my sermon in a sentence. And it's this. Through Isaiah, God reveals what he is really doing in the world to save a people for himself. Through Isaiah, God reveals what he is really doing in the world to save a people for himself. We're going to see this big idea flesh itself out in four points in this one verse. Really, four big themes. We're going to see, first of all, that God speaks. That God speaks. You see that there in the beginning. The vision. We also see, secondly, that God sends. And we'll consider who this Isaiah, the son of Amoz, is. And what it is that he's been called to. We'll see, thirdly, that God saves. And then finally, we'll see that God steers of Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. He is a God that acts in history, steering all things to his desiring, desired ends. God speaks, God sends, God saves, and God steers. Four S's, good alliteration, like any good Baptist sermon. Speak, sins, saves, and steers. Well, beloved, let's consider that first point. God speaks. We see at the very opening of this entire prophecy, the vision. And it's interesting to note that that is not plural. You might think of, as you just kind of scan through Isaiah, that Isaiah is really a collection of lots of visions. But here in the opening, we see that it is the vision, singular. That essentially what we have in front of us is an anthology of Isaiah's entire prophetic work through his entire life. We might call it the essential Isaiah. It is a compendium of all that he sought to preach and to teach and to warn and to reveal concerning those things which God had shown him. All organized together. And how is it organized? Well, in the first 35 chapters, we're going to see all kinds of poetry and oracles and prophecy, all kinds of literary devices. But then in verses or chapters 36 through 39... The poetry and the prophecy is going to give way to history, specifically dealing with the siege of Jerusalem, of what God is doing in history. And then in the rest of the book, chapters 40 to 66, we see more poetry and more prophecy. That first half, the first 35 or so chapters, well, that's mostly doom and gloom, or at least it seems that way. But the second half is going to be mostly hope, a bit more hopeful. You'll find that both are a combination of both doom and gloom, that is, prophecies of judgment, but also of hope. But we see hope continue to build like a sunrise in the second half of Isaiah. So the unfolding sections of this book, listen, they're going to come from all different kinds of occasions, and they're not always going to come in chronological order. But all of them unite together to create one compelling new way of seeing everything. It is a vision. It's a way of seeing. But to say that Isaiah had a vision is not to say that his eyes rolled back into his head and he fell into a trance. In fact, Just one chapter later, in chapter 2, verse 1, we see the vision explained. It is the word that Isaiah saw. That his vision was a word from God. It is God speaking. It is a new way of seeing. That God's word gives us a new perspective on everything. It cuts through all the illusion and the pretense, and it tells us what is really real. This is what we see, if you remember, with Elisha and the young prophet in training. You remember? 
Elisha and this young prophet, they're surrounded in, in Dotan by this Syrian army. And it seems like doom is impending. They're about to get dropped. And this young prophet in training is freaking out. And though Elisha tries to comfort him, he ends up praying, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And then we read that the young man looked up and he saw. What did he see? He saw the Lord's armies, the hosts of the Lord up in the mountains and saw that they greatly outnumbered the Syrian army. They were safe. His eyes were opened. That is what happened to Isaiah. Isaiah's eyes were opened and with his eyes being opened, now he has an all new way of seeing reality. It's a God-saturated view of reality. And it began with his call from God in 740 BC. That is the year that King Uzziah died. We see that in Isaiah chapter 6. And we'll look at that in detail here in a number of weeks. But he says this, that in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw that I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne High and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, and with two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. With two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. That is a super superlative. God in the Bible is never spoken of as being love, love, love. Or justice, justice, justice. Though he is surely love and he is just. No, it is only spoken of God in threefold superlative that he is holy, holy, holy. And this is what Isaiah saw. Was God enthroned and the, and the train of his robe filling his his kingly temple, sitting and reigning over all of his creation as both king and his judge. Isaiah will never walk away viewing reality the same way. And that is what his prophecy intends to do for us. What this means is it makes the prophetic vision of the Bible, including what we see in Isaiah, our clearest view into reality. And so if you and I want to define what is really real, if you and I want to get to the bottom of what is true versus what is false, of what is real versus what is illusory, an illusion, then we don't go to CNN and we don't go to Fox News and we don't go to Instagram and we don't go to Facebook. That is where we just continue to cultivate our virtual realities. We go to God's word. We need God to speak. Otherwise, we can't know. So that means the prophetic vision of the Bible. It is our clearest view into reality. And our natural outlook, the way that we're just kind of naturally bent, is to focus on everything of secondary importance. Some of those things are truly important, but only in a secondary sense. On our jobs, in our day-to-day -day life, and on our circumstances, on our relationships. But in the Bible, as we see with Isaiah 6, God is the central, unavoidable figure everywhere. All the basic questions of our life are, in fact, God questions. And the Christian is the one who has come to grips with the reality that every day of every week of every month of his life, the one thing that he must wrestle with over and above everything is God. It isn't our jobs, it isn't our families, it isn't our relationships, it isn't school and studies, as important as those things may be. They're of secondary importance. The thing that we wrestle with and that we must know is God. And we can't know God unless God opens 
our eyes. We are like that young man with Elijah. We can't see it unless God shows us. And so the heading in Isaiah's book, verse 1 of chapter 1, alerts us that this book, this prophecy, is all about interrupting our familiar ways of thinking about reality. It's as if Isaiah walks up to us, taps us on the shoulder as we struggle with the various problems and questions of life. And he says, hey, there is another way to look at all of this. You interested? Follow me. That's what he's saying in verse one. I have had a vision. God has Spoken, And when he speaks, his, God, his word is disruptive. It disrupts our lives. We cannot leave the same leaving God's word as when we come to God's word. It is meant to disrupt our lives in holy ways. And so without his word, we are confined to our own pretenses and our own illusions and our own bluffs. Oh, but with God's word, new realities open up. Eyes are opened and we see things that have been there all along that we never could have seen before unless God shows us. But if we want to get anything out of Isaiah, as we walk through it week by week, if we want to get anything out of Isaiah, you and I, oh, we've got to be ready to adjust. We've got to be ready to have our little illusory bubbles popped. We've got to be ready to let God's word disrupt our lives, perhaps in even very uncomfortable ways. And we do so knowing that God does it always according to truth and always for our good. It is his grace that God speaks the vision. But we see also in this that God not only speaks, but that God sins. It is the vision of somebody. It's the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos. We don't know who Amos is. Rabbinic tradition holds that he was part of the royal family. And so Isaiah was born essentially into royalty. He was in the upper crust of Jerusalem society. He was a distinguished statesman who enjoyed direct access to Judah's monarchs. And as we find, that is all according to God's providence because it, Isaiah is not going to be speaking and preaching and prophesying to the lower crust in the edges of Jerusalem. He is going to be warning and preaching and speaking to the upper crust, the rulers, the influencers, the kings. He's the preacher to the kings. One of them, in fact, tradition holds, is going to saw him in half. Many scholars think that in Hebrews 11, when it says those being sawed in half, is speaking of the prophet Isaiah. In fact, it was Hezekiah's son. But the question is, how are we to know if this vision was given to Isaiah, how is everyone to know this word that Isaiah has seen? And that's that hand in hand with God speaking is God sending. Sending people to speak on his behalf. How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe on him whom they have not heard? And, and how are they to hear without somebody preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? God is sending the son of Amos. And he is going to be the preacher to kings. And as he preaches, he's going to attack social injustices. And he's going to go after all of the spiritual sins of the time. Especially Judah's tendency to trust in alliances with other nations. Rather than in God and his strength. 
And so Isaiah is going to pronounce judgment on each of these nations. And he's going to urge Judah to trust in God. The southern kingdom, trust God, trust his word, trust his promises. Don't trust in horses. Don't trust in chariots. Don't trust in government. Trust in God. And so by God sending Isaiah, God is sending his word. In fact, throughout Isaiah, throughout the book of Isaiah, that is one of the ways that it's most often spoken of in relation to his word, that God's word is something that he sends. He says he will send my word. And he does it for two reasons. Number one, he sends his word to judge his enemies. He sends his word to judge his enemies. Isaiah 9, 8. The Lord has sent his word against Judah. And it will fall on Israel. The words of the Lord are like an invincible army that lay waste to God's opposition. And so God sends his word to judge his enemies. But he also, secondly, sends his word to create his people. Isaiah 55, 10 and 11, for as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and don't return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth and it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and it will succeed in the thing for which I sent it. God sends his word to create a people. Isaiah is chosen by God and then sent by God to preach. And in sending Isaiah, God is sending his word. And his word does two things. It hardens God's enemies and it saves God's elect. God speaks and God sends. He hardens enemies and he saves God's elect. God speaks and he sends. Because, and here's our third point, God saves. God speaks. Here's the vision. God sends. It's a vision of Isaiah, the son of Amoz. And God saves. We don't know a whole lot about Isaiah. We know the name of his father from right here. We know from Isaiah 8 that he was married with kids and he and his wife did ministry together. She was called a prophetess. And we know from the beginning, the end of the book of Isaiah, that he is obviously a literary genius. But the most important thing about Isaiah isn't who his father is, and it's not who his wife and kids are. It's not even his literary capacity. The most important thing about Isaiah is his name. Isaiah in Hebrew literally means the Lord saves. If Isaiah's vision announces truth from beyond ourselves, then Isaiah's name announces grace that is beyond ourselves. But you and I, in this world, humanity, we don't really like that. We say we want grace, but what we really want is to retain some semblance of control. We want to save face. We want to set our own terms. We want to pay our own way. And in that way, we're no different than the ones to whom Isaiah is preaching. We need the Lord to save. We need the Lord to Isaiah. Because we are sick with sin. And we are totally infected. In fact, from the beginning of Isaiah to the end of Isaiah, he is going to paint a portrait of our hopeless estate apart from the grace of God through imagery of the body. In fact, right here in chapter 1, he's going to talk about our head and our heart. Why will you continue to rebel, he writes? The whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there's no soundness in it, but bruises and sores and raw wounds. They're not pressed out or bound up or softened with oil. You can see that in verse 5. He's saying humanity is like a fatally wounded body that has gone untreated. And there is no hope for recovery in itself. But it's not just our head. And it's not just our hearts. It's also our lips. This was Isaiah's confession when he beheld the holiness of God. He falls on his face and he says, Oh, woe is me, for I am lost. 
I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of an unclean people with unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. A man's lips reveals a man's heart. Unclean lips produce, or unclean hearts produce unclean lips. And the holiness of God has exposed Isaiah's uncleanliness and that of everyone around him. But it's not just our heads. It's not just our hearts. Or it's not just our lips, but it's also our ears and our eyes. Isaiah 42, 18. Hear, you deaf. Look, you blind, that you may see. Isaiah 59, 10. We grope for the wall like the blind. We grope for those who have no eyes and we stumble about at noon as if we are in the twilight. Isaiah is saying because of sin, every converted person is like, or unconverted person is like, it's like a blind man at high noon. That even when the light is brightest, they see only darkness. That even our ears and eyes, spiritually speaking, have been affected. But it goes beyond just our ears and eyes. It's also our hands and our feet. Spiritually speaking, those things that symbolize our ways of life. Isaiah 59, 2-3. Your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. Your sins have been hidden. It's caused him to hide his face from you so that he does not hear. Your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Isaiah 59, 7, just a few verses later. Their feet, not just hands and fingers, but feet run to evil. And they're swift to shed innocent blood. Isaiah is saying that our hands are weak to serve others, but strong to serve ourselves at the expense of others. And our feet are too quick to run towards sin, but unlike Joseph in Potiphar's house, not to run away from it. And so Isaiah uses body imagery from chapter 1 all the way to the end of the book. Our head, our heart, our lips, our hands, our feet, our eyes, our ears to paint a portrait that we are not just a little bit sinful or there's not just bits and pieces of us that are sinful. It is that there is no part of us outwardly or inwardly that has not been touched by and corrupted by the curse of sin. This is what the theologians refer to as total depravity. It is the whole person. Every aspect has been touched by the reality of our sin. And so it's interesting as Isaiah uses all of this body imagery to talk about our uncleanness, to talk about our sin, to talk about our corruption, that he then turns his attention to clothing that we clothe ourselves with. That we attempt to cover our own spiritually corrupted selves with spiritually filthy clothes only so that we can pretend that we're clean. Isaiah 64, 6 to 7. We have all become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf. And our iniquities like the wind take us away. There's no one who calls upon your name, who rouses himself to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us, and you have made us melt in the hand of our iniquities. Every day, we're tempted to treat God as incidental to what really matters to us. And we live by our own strategies of self-salvation. We don't naturally look or think about our choices in this way. But Isaiah shows us new ways of looking at ourselves and of reality. He shows us that our lives are in fact infested with fraudulent idols. That he's going to show us where our hopes really lie. And that any hope that isn't ultimately in God or from God is an idol of our own making. Idolatry is Isaiah's primary concern about us. And in heaping all of our individual idolatries together, we assemble a culture, a brilliant collaborative quest to prove ourselves. And so if you're one of those that tries to think about systemic sin, 
things that seem to spread throughout a culture, a nation, around the world, the Bible has no problem with that category. Because we understand, and Isaiah will show it to us, that a bunch of individual worshipers of not gods come together to create a culture who worships a pantheon of not gods. And that does not lead to the good of one another. It leads to the ravaging of one another. It is a systemic cultural problem. When a bunch of individual idolaters come together and create culture together. Only our culture rarely represents itself in religious language. In fact, it's allergic to doing so. It will vehemently assert that nothing in culture should be, or at least if it is true, religious in nature. It must be objective as opposed to subjective. So it rarely presents itself with religious language. But it's interesting, Ernest Becker in his Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Denial of Death, Explain how we serve it every day, that is the religion of our culture, with faithful devotion. He wrote this. We disguise our struggle by piling up figures in a bank book to reflect privately our sense of heroic worth. Or by having only a little better home in the neighborhood, a bigger car, brighter children. But underneath throbs the ache of cosmic specialness. I love that phrase. No matter how we mask it in concerns of smaller scope. In other words, what he's saying is we're trying to, we're trying to dull and feed and meet the ache of cosmic specialness with superficial not gods of our own making. Things in which we find our identity and our security and our worth in people and in possessions. Things which death and rust and moth will destroy and will always let us down. That's why Isaiah, oh, he knows the destructive power of all of our non-gods. Which is why he says in Isaiah 44, 20, we feed on ashes. A deluded heart has led him astray. And we cannot deliver ourselves. And we cannot say, is there not a lie in my right hand? He's going, we're blind. We can't even see it. We've got these dead, not gods that we've given all of our devotion to. And we give all of our fealty and all of our worship and all of our hope and all of our identity to all of its false promises that it will never make good on. And we can't even see it. We are feeding on ashes It leads only to death. But Isaiah is not just an expert in the destructive power of non-gods. As his name suggests, Isaiah, he is an expert in a salvation we don't even know how to define apart from God's initiating grace. Let's just walk through this step by step. The Lord saves. It's not just lowercase l, Lord, as if he's Lord among many lords. There is a definite article. He is the Lord. There is no one in heaven, on earth, or below the earth other than he is the one true God. He is the Lord. And so the triune God, the vision that we're going to get in Isaiah as we walk through it, is the vision of a triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, all working together in sovereign wisdom and power and love to save a people of his own choosing. The Father electing, the Son fulfilling the Father's will by redeeming, and the Spirit executing the purpose of the Father and the Son by renewing and by sealing. This is who the Lord is. That only a triune God like that could overflow with such love and of grace and of power so as to save those who cannot save themselves. Those who are dining on ashes. Those who are so fatally wounded, spiritually speaking, that they cannot heal themselves. 
the Lord. But we also see that the Lord does something. The Lord saves. That this God does everything. And Isaiah is going to show us that from the first to the last, he is the one involved in bringing man from spiritual death in Adam to spiritual life in Christ. And before time began, God the Father chose the Son to accomplish the noble work of purchasing a chosen people by his blood. In fact, Isaiah says in Isaiah 42, 6, that the Father appointed his Son to be, quote, a covenant for the people. And so Isaiah speaks these words of the Son of God. The Spirit of the Lord, God, is upon me. He's just speaking Jesus' words. The Spirit, of the, Lord of God, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That is the year of Jubilee. The year in which all who are under debt are set free. And the day of vengeance of our God. It's interesting that at the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry, Luke chapter 4. Jesus unrolls the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And he reads those words. Bringing good news to the poor, binding up the brokenhearted, proclaiming liberty to the captives, opening the prison to those who are bound. Jesus reads all of this and he tells the crowd, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. I'm that one upon whom the spirit of the Lord has been set. I'm the one bringing good news and I am the very object of that good news. He is the one who has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. I've been sent to proclaim liberty to the captives and to open the prison to those who are bound. Isaiah saw a triumphant king bringing liberty and freedom to God's people and judgment to God's enemies. Oh, it's glorious. But Isaiah also saw that this triumphant king would be a suffering servant. That the Messiah must go through a cross to get his crown. Because unless payment for sin is made. There can be no liberty for those who are captive to sin. And there can be no freedom for those who are bound under its power. Sin has to be dealt with. That's why Isaiah prophesies. Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. We sung this today in our in our worship, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed, not for his iniquities, but for our iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that brings us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Christ absorbs God's wrath for the sins of God's people. And as a result, God's elect can now stand before the holy, holy, holy king and judge of the universe, not as those who are unclean, but as those who are now declared righteous. Isaiah continues, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. That when his soul makes an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring. That's his reward. He shall prolong his days. He will live again forever. And the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He will not fail. That out of the anguish of his soul shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, be counted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. I love this phrase. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. That's amazing. God 
plans it and he achieves it. God pays and he redeems. He calls and he keeps. He justifies, he sanctifies, and he glorifies. The will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. He cannot fail. The triumphant king is the suffering servant. This is why when you get to the gospel of Mark, the way that Jesus most often refers to himself is the son of man. It's the title that he gives himself through the first eight chapters of the gospel of Mark, son of man, son of man, son of man, most common title for himself. But then in Mark chapter eight, a turn happens where he says the son of man is going to have to suffer many things. And he begins to predict his death. He does it three more times until it actually is fulfilled. And what Jesus is doing is taking two prophecies The Son of Man prophecy from Daniel chapter 7 of the Son of Man given all dominion and authority and rule eternally from the ancient of days. The one who will rule forever, conquer his enemies and be established in righteousness infinitely for eternity. He combines that Son of Man with the Isaiah suffering servant. That the way that the triumphant Son of Man comes to assume his crown and sit in his kingdom with his redeemed people is so that he might suffer in their place for you. You realize every time we take the Lord's Supper, we're just mimicking the language of Isaiah 53. Given for you. For you. For you in your place. That is Isaiah. The Lord saves. That's his message. So not only does the Lord speak, not only does God send, but he does those things so that he might save. And all of this is seen in one giant God-centered reality And that's our fourth point. God steers. It's the vision. God speaks of Isaiah, the son of Amoz, the one whom he has called and sent. And the message that he speaks is found in his very name that the Lord saves. And he's doing all of this concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, four kings of Judah. Isaiah's vision revolves around the sovereignty of God. We just saw in Isaiah 6 how he saw God enthroned as both king and judge of the world. And he was overwhelmed and he was humbled by his sovereignty. Well, he would later on go to preach that this sovereignty extends not only to Judah and Israel, as we see here in one one, but also to all of the nations of the earth. Isaiah 14, 24 to 27. The Lord of hosts has sworn. As I have planned, so shall it be. And as I have purposed, so shall it stand. This is the purpose that is purposed concerning the whole earth. And this is the hand that is stretched out over all the nations. For the Lord of hosts has purposed. And who will annul it? Answer, nobody. His hand is stretched out. Who will turn it back? Answer, nobody. No portion of God's plan will go unfulfilled. From before creation, God has decreed his perfect purposes for every nation and period in human history. And God's decree is as unchangeable as God is unchangeable. Listen to this, Isaiah 46, 9 to 11. Remember the former things of old, for I am God. And there is no other. I am God. And there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from the ancient times. Things not yet done. Saying my counsel shall stand. And I will accomplish my purpose. 
Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of counsel from a far country. I have spoken and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed and I will do it. Isaiah's vision revolves around the sovereignty of God. And it's from it that we learn that God's sovereignty is infinite and irresistible and irreversible and immutable and invincible. Our sin cannot thwart it. The nations cannot thwart it. Nobody can thwart the sovereign purposes of Almighty God. That is at the very heart, and that is at the very center of Isaiah's prophecy. And that's what we get to spend the next 19 years looking at. Or however long it takes us to get through 66 chapters. God has chosen for himself a people that he will give to his son as an inheritance. And all of the elect in every nation will respond by God's grace and repentance and faith to the proclamation of the good news that Isaiah, the Lord, saves. And when we consider how God's purposes through Adam and Abraham, through Moses and David, through Judah and through Israel, through kings such as Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, and every ruler that has ever sat on any throne. When we consider all of this and how all of God's promises and purposes have found their yes and amen in Jesus Christ, and when we consider how he has providentially worked to bring about his saving purposes in Christ through Israel and to the rest of the world. And we say with Isaiah and we say with Paul who quotes Isaiah, who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Who has given him a gift that he might be repaid? No, we say, oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. That is what the vision of Isaiah is all about. And we're going to start diving in next Sunday in chapter 1. Verse 2. Let's pray together.